Hey everybody, welcome to this first installment of the Contributor of the Month. There's some kind of new events and video ideas that we come up with through brainstorming sessions and then there's other ones that come up through necessity. And this is definitely the case because uh, we've had definitely so many incredible contributors uh, contributing so much uh, work that we've found it quite necessary to uh, acknowledge uh, your work and to acknowledge the the uh, and, and to just kind of like bring visibility to, to all the work that's being done in the in the the open source community of commissar so uh so this is the first one and this is the first uh um open source contributor that, that we wanted to acknowledge um shubham palriwala i don't know if i said that uh correctly but just before jumping on this, I did a quick uh, search of, of what the name Shubham means. And uh, let me know if it's true. I, th this is only from one Google search, but it said that Shubham in Sanskrit means ambitious or bright. And I didn't feel that that could be like more fitting. Well, first of all, is that true? Have you ever heard that uh, Shubham means ambitious in Sanskrit? Would it be weird if I say I am hearing the name of my... <laughs> The meaning of my word for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm pretty sure you are correct because I have no idea what it means. Well, I mean, regardless if it's true or not, I just thought that it was so fitting and it, that it was uh, so coincidental that it means ambitious and bright because, of course, you're definitely very, very bright. And you've been working on a pretty ambitious uh, feature that, that you shipped in May, which uh, brought us to the undeniable conclusion that you had to be the contributor of the month so thanks a million for being here thanks a million for being a contributor so um shubham before we uh, get into uh, what you've been working on do you want to tell us a little bit about your background i'd be curious to know how you got involved in open source uh, in the first place sure sure so first of all thank you so much for having me yesterday when you pinged me it turned out to be a great day it wasn't going that way so yeah hi everyone um I am Shubham. I am currently a final year undergrad from VIT, a college in India. And uh, I was a person who did not know what is tech apart from playing games till standard 12th, that is till 18 years of age. And then in, co in my university, in my college, I saw everybody, including my seniors, dive into, hey, blockchain is trending, ML is there, everything. So I was, I was never involved. But then, then came Corona, the, the pandemic, and I realized, hey, I am feeling this kind of out of place. Let me just get let me just understand what these buzzwords means. Slowly from there on to making my own projects, going to hackathons and then from hackathons pushing our projects to public to realizing, okay, what is GitHub? And surprisingly for, for me, I learned GitHub first before Git. So that is a, <laughs> that is a fun task. So that's how I got into open source space. And then I learned about how you can contribute to others projects without actually getting in a company. So that sounded very fascinating to me where you can help, you can learn the code base, you can learn. Oh yeah, that's pretty much how I got in, in the open source space and introduced to it, yeah. Very, very cool. And uh, have you worked at uh, any companies or done any internships or, or is it uh, mainly through the, the, the like project-based uh, interactions that you've been working so far? So till my second year, I was only involved with projects and hackathons. Um, then, then there's so... To be honest, the only internship I'm doing is currently. Before this, I haven't done any internships. I've only done open source programs. So I started with the summer of Bitcoin. And I did my Linux Foundation mentorship by the CNCF in Kivarno. After that, I did my GitHub externship in a Bangalore-based company. After that, I did my Google season of documentation that was involving machine learning and documentation. And after that, last year, I did my Google summer of code, you know, by Zoo Shop. So again, there's no such internships, companies or corporate culture. It's just that contributing and learning from them. And right now I'm interning at Cisco. So technically this is my first internship. Yes. Very, very cool. Just a quick question before we jump into the, the work that you've done, um, specifically around kind of um, uh, Indian uh, university uh, higher education, because um, a any kind of um, university student that I've met from India, um, especially when uh, talking about technical degrees, um, I I've heard that a, a lot of the curriculum, a lot of the degrees are quite challenging, uh, quite difficult. First of all, it's, it's even quite difficult to, to gain access to them. 
but almost without uh, without exception, all of the students that I've met, apart from doing these really challenging uh, um, degrees, they're also working in open source. They're also contributing and doing a lot of kind of like extracurricular uh, activities. Why do you think that is? Do you, do you think it's because it's just um, like the, the, the engineering students that are around you are naturally curious or, or, or is it because there's kind of like a necessity also apart from or, or maybe like the curriculum, even though it's challenging, maybe isn't enough for the real world? What's your kind of gauge on the situation? Um, so I think for me, it's all about curiosity and the culture, especially the culture. So in my university, it is kind of huge. We have 3000 students doing computer science in the same year. So it's not like all 3000 know open source. It's about the culture. I was a part of this student chapter called IEEE. So therein we were so, at least I was so fantasized by, hey, what are you doing? How can you contribute to something like Cilium? Such a big company, so making such billions, how can you write code for them? Like, it's out there, just go take a look. And once you take a look, then you see, oh, I, I knew Python, but this is something new. Go is a it's limited in Go, but still, for example, like, like production grade code is very different than what we write in our projects. So that's the curiosity, I would say. The curriculum is again, I think, manageable. I would not say it is the most difficult. It's all about how much you want to challenge yourself, right? Because in university, you have different targets. Some people have, okay, I want to dive into the college sports team. I want to explore as much as I can. I want to try out new domains. Somebody sticks, okay, this is my technical domain. I just want to go as deep as I can in this. Somebody wants to be a jack of all trades. So I think for me, it's about the culture that is uh, slowly and very quickly getting in the Indian universities that your university does not define you. It's what you do apart from that. Yeah, I, to I totally understand because I'm sure that um yeah like myself as someone who's gone to university too and um, there's a lot of kind of like words that go associated to your university uh, degree but not not like when i think back to my university studies like the pursuit of curiosity wasn't necessarily the topest priority uh, like uh, so so it's it's normal that that you would go seeking it uh, outside but perfect cool um yeah so Let's move on to 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 what brings us uh, here today. Um, you're absolute. Well, uh, you're you're the contributor of the month, not just because of one uh, contribution. Uh, it, you've been contributing for a while now and and adding great value, but um, but but in particular, you have something to to show us, which will be really cool. And just to give a little bit of context, um, if anyone here is watching that doesn't know, uh, the Commissar is an open source, uh, cloud transparency and cloud cost optimization um, tool that you can connect multiple cloud providers and very quickly fetch resources that uh, can be then aggregated into custom views to be able to to, to create logical and uh, and logical groupings to be able to gain insights into what resources are uh, in your cloud environment what costs are associated to those resources and then you can then create uh, alerts on top of those uh, custom views up until now we had uh, an integration with slack that would allow you to be alerted directly into a slack channel if costs went went over a certain threshold or if the number of resources went over a certain threshold but now with uh, the the custom webhooks you've expanded that capability so uh, having said that if you want to take it away and, and share your screen and, and let us see what you've been working on. Yep, yep. Let me quickly share it. Let me know once it's visible. Um, yeah, visible now. Great. So, if right now anybody's watching the stream and does not know what webhooks mean, don't worry when I did not. So, my initial plan of action is to document. So this was in the last contributors call that we had and there were certain e there were certain features that the team was looking and you know and were open to open source contributions. So I picked something up. I had no idea what webhooks are and how they work. So I created a notion page. Um a usual YouTube search what are webhooks from scratch everything. And then I started documenting stuff, what all is needed, a plan of action, models and everything, timelines, so that the team is up to date with what I'm doing and some notes that I have and all the resources that a team has provided. This usually helps me keep everything in one place and to figure out I'm not going out of my path. 
So that is pretty much it. If anybody wants, I'll share this notion base so you have a rough idea of how mm -hmm. it works. Now coming quickly to a quick demo of my feature. Um, this is how you can start Comesa. If you're starting it for the first time, you can just get clone in and do a go build and then dot Comesa. That will start it up. Since I already have built it, I have just run a go build the binary. So I just started it. And jump to the inventory page. Uh, you will see a lot of views. These two are the default views. You can create or more, more views by filtering. Let's say I want to filter by cost it is uh, greater than and set the value as zero and I'll apply the filter. I get this now. I can save it as a view. I can call it monthly call. Okay. Saved it. Now I can see all the resources that cost more than zero dollars. And now we'll switch back to this one because this is kind of something that I've said. Expensive is again the same filter that uh, Comisa gives you by default, which is really helpful. I go back to the untapped resources, that is all the resources that Comisa can fetch based on your cloud integrations, which is simply a Slack file, which is simply a config file, so it's very easy. Now going to alerts, you can, you initially would have no alerts, you can set alerts up. Now before my PR, there was only the option for Slack, but now you can also add a webhook as well. So let's just, let's initially add Slack, so you can just set up what the name of your alert should be, let's say Slacky. And limit, I set it to one dollar. Whenever this view goes above one dollar, you should alert me. That's what this does. And this runs a cron job for every hour. So every hour you will get an alert. And this is for Slack. Um, now I show you what I have added. That is webhooks. So with webhooks, there's the same. You can add either cost or resources. I'll do resources here. So I'll call it contributor of the month. Because why not? <laughs> I will flex if I can. Um, the resources I'll save it to let's say 12 that is limit that is the moment this causes 12 resources you should trigger it and endpoint now with slack the endpoint is fixed that is the slack channel that you configure it to with webhooks you can pass it to anything let it it can be your github action it can be your jira ticket it can be anything so for testing purposes we have this amazing free site called webhook.site they also have a paid feature but this free one works amazingly so I'll copy this custom webhook url that's generated for me I'll put it here now one thing that we wanted especially the designers of Comiser is that you should have a testing endpoint because that really adds to the UX of the feature. So we added this feature called test endpoint where you can test an endpoint and a Comiser tests it by setting by sending a test request that is a hey, Comiser version that will be sent to you when you hit it the view and the message. So you have a rough idea okay this is how my webhook would look like. So this is just for testing you can add a secret. So one of the best practices that I found out when I was researching about webhooks is usually payment methods like Stripe have their own secret that they pass it to the clients. So the client can be sure, okay, this request is coming from Stripe because we share this secret. Otherwise, anybody can just, you know, recreate a Stripe domain and send it. So there's no phishing as such. So we have the secret, it is option. Right now, I'll just keep it as Shubham. And I'll set this a lot up. One thing to keep in mind is this does not get triggered right now. As I said, this is an hourly cron job that runs. So to save everybody's an hour and to show you this thing still works, I'll go Comisa start again. And as you can see, we have that one webhook popped up. I'll open it up and this says Comisa unknown. Unknown because I'm on the master branch right now. This is the development purposes. You'll have the Comisa enterprise or the release branch that you use. The view, the view, I have this untagged resources. So that's the view. The user's alert that I've set for the resources and the data is 55. That means there are 55 resources right now, way above the limit I've set and the timestamp. We added this timestamp so it's easier for everybody to figure out and to sort and do their analysis as well. And you can see we have this authorization which we check the secret as well, right? So authorization also has this secret called Shubham. So this makes sure, okay, this came from Comisa because I gave them the secret. So that is pretty much it. Um, this is my PR if anybody wants to take a look, suggest changes I would be glad to consider and move forward with them. That would really help the project. And yeah, um, again, as I've said this before, this. PR wouldn't have been possible without Jake himself making the community so open and Mohammed and Ali for amazing feedback and so amazing project that I hardly had to create components. Everything had a component. This was a component. This entire thing was a component. Everybody, everything was so component and so modular. It was really fast for me to adopt to it. So yeah, I think that is pretty much it. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. That um, feature opens up so many options now because uh, now you're, we're not limited to a Slack channel. Now, uh, if 
you're alerted, you can then trigger whatever kind of automation you, you have now. You, any third party that, that receives a, a webhook uh, trigger can now be triggered. So the, the options are really endless. I, I'm just imagining uh, some sort of cost threshold that's being breached that then sends a trigger over to pager duty then a relevant team is alerted and that might even automatically create a jira ticket that needs to be addressed by somebody uh, yeah so the, there's really no end of of use cases so yeah thanks many for that again and uh, as just as um I was going to say as a token of our appreciation, but it, it's really not just because of this feature, but it's about your continued effort and uh, and and contribution over the last few months with the project that that we we spoke yesterday about um, officially um, announcing you as the first maintainer of the project, which is really huge for us because uh, it's something that we thought would be interesting to have at some stage. Uh, in the past when we started talking about how we can maintain and and in, be inclusive to contributors but we also didn't want to uh, do it forcefully and, and and we wanted to see people kind of organically um, kind of grow into that kind of uh, role and you've definitely done so so now you're going to have freedom to to review PRs to, to merge uh, to, to master and um, uh, have have you planned on how you're going to use that power? <laughs> uh, so firstly, it's going to be a very difficult task because the community is really is really one of the best ones thanks to you and everybody in the open source space. So it is going to be a difficult task to stand out being a maintainer. <laughs> but I'll try to keep up as much as I can to make sure bo your, Mohammed, Cyrus, everybody's workload gets reduced so that I can do the initial review part, help, help the first time contributors in some way because right now you have made it really easy thanks to the atomic issues that you have up for the first time contributors. So it's going to be a challenge. I haven't ideated on it yet. But yeah, you might soon expect a plan of action on an ocean page. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And we definitely have to, 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 to also help you as much as possible with um, with with giving you all the support that you need and and even though you you are officially a, a maintainer now that does not mean that the the that you're alone uh, in 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 the kind of the responsibility of, of the repo so i think it's going to be a great kind of learning experience for for everyone involved so so very cool um you you do a, a lot of stuff as we've covered already and i was wondering how do you learn new things do you have any kind of like productivity hacks or any um kind of uh, particular tricks that you use to to learn things quickly because um you you took up webhooks and you understood the concept um in uh, and implemented uh, a webhook feature in a, in a week so how do you learn so quickly um i think it cannot go without thanking the creators out there for example a seven minute video youtube video can right now teach somebody so much than reading or going through a 30 minute white paper so there is a lot of credit due for the creators content creators that some somebody like you right you create these periodic youtube shorts that are really was like today only you put up your github actions versus jenkins so these are something that help a lot to people in a passive way so there is a lack of recognition I feel to them. So I think uh, like my entire learning obviously goes to the open source space. People putting up content to learn, people putting up issues to contribute. So because for me, I am contributing as a project. You think, okay, this one is contributing. It's great. It's volunteering there. We are helpful. But as a contributor, I get to learn a lot because for me, it's an entire production grade company making money out of this and I am getting a chance to help them. In turn, I am, I am learning much more. I am learning how to communicate with them, how to share my ideas, how to give back, how to help others. And apart from that, scaling up in terms of tech. So all in all, for me, this is a great thing. So learning for me is just about, okay, I think I drifted. <laughs> but yeah, um, how do I learn quick? I think I'm a very slow learner. I somehow end up diving to the rabbit hole. So I have this approach that let's say I'm reading a sentence. If I don't get one term, I go that. So I have this depth first search approach where I try to go down as deep as I can and then slowly come up again so that I have this fundamental knowledge, then I can build upon it. 
so that kind of limits me to learning one text tag at a time for example if i'm doing blockchain i end up doing only blockchain because then my mind gets mixed up forward with these two things working for me it's about what for me dfs clicks depth first search that is diving down deep for some people bfs that is knowing the beef of everything works for me it's like if i dive into it i should know fundamentally at least everything i can't know everything obviously there's a lot but yeah fundamentals help a lot very cool yeah i'm also one uh, to go down a rabbit hole or two uh, but um but yeah it does it does really help to get a fundamental um yeah just understanding of what the base is and even though you don't maybe go too deep in in every single one of those pillars at least you know at least a simplistic answer to to why of of each of the questions of of each pillar um, yep. And yeah, this DFS definitely does not work with Kubernetes. Kubernetes throws you down very deep. So for Kubernetes, I had to shift to BFS to get a rough idea of the entire ecosystem. Yeah, and I I've definitely found that uh, Kubernetes in particular, it's um it's a technology that you kind of learn. I don't. I wonder if, if other things are like this too, but I've I've realized that there's the, the different components and the different, the, the way you interact with Kubernetes, it kind of reminds me of an, of an ecosystem more than just a tool. So to like theoretically learn uh, Kubernetes to be able to pass an exam is one thing, but then to be able to like troubleshoot Kubernetes is a different thing. And you might spend a, a few months trying to pass an exam and that's cool you will know kubernetes to in a theoretical sense but then on the in, in like in a day-to-day -day kind of um devops position or as an sre troubleshooting why is um this uh deployment failing and 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 i can't get it the, the pods to stand up that's a, a very difficult d different thing and so so yeah you're kind of like learning different aspects of the ecosystem and it, and it does go deep for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one last thing that I wanted to 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 ask, and I think this is something that I'm going to ask um, each contributor of the month, which is um, sometimes when I look on kind of like t technological blogs and people that that write about open source, there always seems to be no matter like how many uh, tutorials on how to get uh, started in in open source no matter how many of those exist there's always people in in the comment section saying oh i would love to get involved how how do i do it how uh wh what tips would you have people it seem to be discovering open source every day and it, sometimes it takes them a while to be directed into the into the right way of starting in your words or in your opinion what tips would you give people that are interested in getting started in open source and, and, and where would you recommend for them to start? So one tip that I got from my senior is you can never know the entire code base. This is one misconception that people have that, hey, this is too big. I do not know it. Uh, an initial PR starts with a change in one line in one file and PR is not just an only way to contribute, right? You can help by making a better UX. Let's say you know front end, then maybe you start with fixing CSS for them, making the website more responsive. Maybe you are more of a documentation person. Go to the readme, go to the documentation, see what you as a first time reader finds difficult, fix that so that the next time a first time reader comes, it's easy for them. If you are a developer, then great, then dive down. You do not need to know the entire journey the, the project has been through, what the project wants, what are the major issues. There, there might be some issue which is two years old, but it's still open because it still needs to be fixed. So that is one thing. And secondly, I think the difference between a contributor and somebody who's interested is the initial git clone and running the project locally. Once you run the project locally, right? That's where you try to play around with it, change something, see, oh, what happens if I do this? Oh, this can be done better. So for me, the initial friction that is running a go build and a dot slash commuter start. That is something that can really help and which thanks to go and next is really easy in, in our case to start a local build. So for me, it's about 
not getting lost in this huge space figuring out what you want to do that is okay now because i think the open source space is huge right like today you would say a good first issue tomorrow you would do something else and you would feel like hey i want to contribute to both but i do not know where to start change your mind fix one thing spend a week on it if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out but at least stick to it try out whatever you can and one thing is that i have learned through mistakes before asking for help search for help because 99% of the time there is the same thing on the same discord channel somewhere up two months ago if you have an issue if an error message is copy pasted on the discord or slack or github you would definitely find a solution for it and that would make the process really fast for you as well so yeah i think that's it perfect well said wise words so mr shubham aka mr uh what was it uh mr ambitious aka mr bright <laughs> Uh, thanks a million. Um, congrats again for uh, being the contributor of the month, for being uh, the first commissar maintainer. We're so happy to keep on working alongside you. Um, yeah. Sure, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the community and I hope to help more people ahead. Cool. All the best. Have a great week. Yep. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.